Great, so it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Miss Catherine Whitehouse. Um, I hope that's a reasonable photo. Um, she is a consultant neurosurgeon who's based in Cardiff. Uh, and after her medical studies at Cardiff University, Miss Whitehouse completed her foundation training in South Wales before undertaking specialty training in the Southwest Peninsula Deanery, during which she served as FRCS examination rep for the BNTA. She then completed a fellowship in neurosurgical oncology at Southampton and has now returned to Cardiff, where she's appointed as local, local consultant neurosurgeon uh, at University Hospital Wales. In addition, she currently works with the SBNS SAC Workforce Planning Committee. She co-runs the National Neurosurgery Finishing School, and she has interest in teaching, including at the FRCS courses in Aberdeen and London. We're very grateful to Ms Whitehouse uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Nancy, for having me to talk. Thank you to BMA for supporting this endeavour. Um, I am going to do a talk on neuro-oncology and a little bit more about the career and um, what it involves, ongoing research and things like that. Um, let's get this working. Whenever I was a student, which wasn't that long ago, I like to think, uh, whenever I did anything, I came up with outcomes, uh, which, who was it good for? Who was I doing this for? What was I going to do with it? Um, now, obviously, from your guys' point of view, I have no idea who you are. I have no idea if I'm ever going to see you. So you don't have to really care about making me happy. Some of the things that I mentioned might help towards your exam. But to be honest with you, a lot of the uh, more clinical and medical stuff I'm going to be talking about is going to be above your level. Um, but it's interest is what I'm into, really. Making your CV look good. Well, I'm sure you're already all over that. I'm trying to maybe hit the uh, hidden curriculum of making you a good doctor, making you think about certain things, analysis of data, that sort of thing. But the main reason why we're doing this and hopefully that you're in Lansig and you're looking at this talk is that you're interested in it. And therefore, even though a lot of the stuff I will be talking about is above student level, you're actually interested in it and it's gonna hopefully make you even more interested. Um, I probably don't need to tell you the pathway of how you get into neurosurgery and how you get into neuro-oncology, but there's some of you who might be a little bit more junior. So as you guys know, you go through medical school, you qualify, you do your F1 and F2. And in about December of your F2, you apply for national selection for neurosurgery. So that's one application form and it covers the entire country, not Ireland. Um, for neurosurgery and then the shortlisting occurs the interviews are around now actually so some of you might um, some people who might be F2s now might be looking at um, their interviews coming up over the next few days and people generally find out if they've got in or not at early February this process is really really competitive it always has been it's going to be more competitive the more you guys are getting interested in these sort of things and get more exposure to neurosurgery. Uh, when I was applying, there were 18 posts in the year in the country. Nowadays, I think there's 16. There were a few more a few years ago, but I think the, uh, the Workforce Planning Committee has realised that maybe they gave a few too many people jobs about that. But that's another discussion for another day. You then do ST1 to ST8. Now, generally, ST1 and ST2, you do a little bit of neurosurgery, but you also do some allied specialties to give you a good overall understanding of things. Um, and then registrar years tend to be ST3 to ST8. You can take time out if you want. You can do a PhD. You can do research. You can go off and do all sorts of clinical attachments internationally if you can get permission from your um, postgraduate dean. Um, and from your TPD. And then generally nowadays, if you want to go into oncology and most other subspecialties, you do a fellowship. Now that's partly because when you finish ST8, you do your FRCS, you do your exams, and you get your completion of certificate of training, that's called a CCT. You are a general neurosurgeon. Nowadays, because there is a lot more subspecialization, people tend to need to do an extra fellowship. Um, just to get them off the ground a bit more and give them that subspecialist knowledge. And also, at the moment, there aren't many consultant jobs around. So you do find there are a lot of these senior trainees who have got their CCT doing fellowships. And then once you've done that, you've got to try and get a consultant post somewhere. And to be honest with you, 
I'm not even quite there yet because I'm a local. So, why would you want to do neuro-oncology? What, what sort of patients do we see? Now, I'm not going to talk too much about what I do in my day-to-day -day practice, but I can tell you that in a sentence. Uh, I operate during the week. I have a couple of clinics. I do an MDT. And generally, most subspecialties also have to do a little bit of general neurosurgery. So some of the on-calls, um, in which you can see all sorts of traumas, vascular, all sorts of problems, and some sort of degenerative spine and some of the more common things, some hydrocephalus, etc. But within neuro-oncology, there are different types of patients. You do see a lot of patients, though unfortunately their disease is very sad, malignant, and they're not going to survive very long. And it's a, it's a really difficult time. It's the most difficult time these patients are going to have. Some of the news that you are going to be telling those patients is the worst news they've ever had. The impact on themselves and their families is absolutely awful. And so you've got, you've got to be comfortable doing that and you've got to be able to help them. It's more psychologically as well as with surgery as much as you can. The other group of patients are those that have a condition that they live with years so these might be things like low-grade gliomas um, other sort of low-grade tumors uh, some sort of mening some meningiomas things like that and so you will see them year on year they will be continuing to have scans you will know them quite well in a professional capacity of course they may need many treatments and interventions they might need a lot of discussions that are quite difficult what's best now, should we wait, when should we do it, what stage of your life are you at? And there's quite a lot of psychological impact for those patients to tell them, okay, you've got this condition, you are now gonna be somewhat tied to a hospital for 10 years, 20 years, the rest of your life. Some people might take the attitude of thinking they have a ticking time bomb in their head and you've gotta be able to say to them that it's not, it's not best to have that attitude because Everything that I do for these patients is to try and give them as good a life for as long as is possible. And so part of that is considering a family, getting married if they want to get married, and having, and having a job and thinking about a career. But when you first tell them their diagnosis, sometimes people just cannot cope with that at all, understandably. So it's just working with people with those sorts of things. I'm just going to put this little definition of the word tumour up just so that you guys are clear of the sorts of things that I'm talking about. Because you're going to see patients with tumours, brain tumours, all sorts of things like that. And tumour doesn't necessarily mean cancer. It doesn't necessarily mean malignant. It means lump, an abnormal growth of tissue. So if you are seeing patients who've got brain tumours, don't necessarily assume that they're malignant, don't necessarily assume they've got cancer. And on the other hand, if you see a patient who's got things like meningiomas that are classified as tumors, don't tell them they have cancer because they might not, or they don't, they might not. So just be aware that tumor doesn't necessarily mean cancer, especially within the head. And neuro-oncology gives opportunity for lots of things. There's lots of research that goes on in neuro-oncology. There's lots of people who are interested in research. Um, there are lots of people who have professorships across the country. Well, I say lots. There's, there's a number of people across the country who have professorships. Um, so there's lots of av avenues for doing that if you want to come out and do a PhD. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the sort of things that are available towards the end. One reason why I um, particularly like what I do is that I like working in a team. I like collaboration. I like chatting with people. Um, I'm just, I like people. And so this is our pre-COVID neuro-oncology MDT, which is you know, myself, some other neurosurgeons, our neuro-oncology nurse specialist, and these guys are absolutely brilliant. They are key to helping you with the patients um, because they are really good people for the patients to talk to. Um, and to understand a lot more about the holistic care as well. You've got radiologists, pathologists, administrators, pediatric oncologists, oncologists, salt, neuropsychology, 
physios, OTs, loads and loads of people, neurophysiology to help you with your monitoring. And so you have to work, you have to be good with people, you have to understand that all these people are professionals, you are not better than them. The neuro-oncology MDT is not a neurosurgery MDT, it's neuro-oncology and everybody has an equal part to play. As I've already mentioned, to do neuro-oncology, you have to be comfortable with talking to patients, you have to be comfortable with difficult conversations. Like I say, your face is gonna be on the worst thing they've ever heard. So you have to be good with people. And then technically speaking, it is surgery within the brain itself. I've always enjoyed mapping out the brain and understanding what the brain does in certain parts of it. You know, your left motor cortex affecting your right arm, brilliant. Um, so I've always enjoyed the fact that it's surgery within the brain itself. And I just really, really enjoy, as a rather sad individual, um, developing planes within the brain and that sort of that sort of surgery it's just it just really appeals to me other people might enjoy the anatomy of a skull base and uh, doing dissection to find the nerves and blood vessels and things like that different things appeal to different people so a bit of a debate that's going on at the moment and is slightly tipping towards my favor is, is neuro-oncology really a subspecialty? So when I was in training, it was one of these things that if a patient had a glioblastoma, for example, they have a really bad prognosis, unfortunately. And so the attitude was very much that anyone can do it, any neurosurgeon can do it. It's general neurosurgery. You go in, chop out the bit that looks a bit bad. Don't necessarily really tell them much about the disease itself. And then you pass them on to the oncologists who then have to say, by the way, even though you've gone through all this, you've only got a year left. And that's not right, because you shouldn't really be operating on people without giving them, in my opinion, a good idea of what the benefits are of the operation versus not having it. And so you should really give them an idea of why you're doing it and, and the time that it may or may not buy them, because they might think that in doing the operation, that you're giving them an extra 20 odd years and you're not. So nowadays you have to have good up to date with the evidence uh, discussions with the patient and, and really share information with them and understand their point of view as well. So uh, I did my oncology fellowship with Paul Grundy down in Southampton who has done a lot of work in things like shared decision-making and making sure that patients really have been provided with the adequate information to to do what they need to do or want to do um, so that that's vital and um, we've got lots of new bits of kit and exciting new revelations in terms of our gadgets that um, really do not necessarily need someone who's subspecialized but needs someone who's interested in it and are going to keep up with those with those changes especially as of course People who work in medical technology want to keep updating things because they want to keep selling you the new best kit that's possible. So they will keep coming up with updates that you have to keep learning. You can't just have a go anymore at a brain tumor. You should strive for a complete resection. Um, so you have to really be good at doing that, really concentrate on doing that and have the mindset of, of pushing the boundaries as much as you can, as long as it is safe. And then the other thing as well is there's been a lot more work recently in new models of anatomy, understanding of white matter fibers and not really accepting as much causing any deficits or problems when you're operating on people. And hopefully the more that we do do both of these things and become better at them, the better the outcomes will be for the patients. So this here is the WHO 2016 classification of tumours. And as you can see for brain tumours, there are a lot of them. Some of which are our bread and butter, very common. We see them all the time. So that's these diffuse astrocytic and oligodendro tumours and oligodendroglial tumours, meningiomas, metastases. These, these, these probably make up about 90% of the work that comes through neuro-oncology. 
Lymphomas generally go through um, hematology and our role in that is biopsy predominantly because they can get treated by chemotherapy. And then there's lots of other things that you don't see quite so frequently, but you still have to know about, you still have to be able to deal with. I'm gonna talk really, really briefly about metzomeningiomas just because we do see so much of them. And I'm gonna talk then a lot more about gliomas. So by that, I mean diffuse astrocytic oligodendroglial tumors and glioblastoma because there's been quite a lot of changes over the past 10 years in how these are categorized. That's really important for people who are doing your oncology to understand and then understand what's gone on with the, the evidence behind them. So that's the bit where it might get a bit boring and I get all excited, so I do apologise in advance. So METs are the most common type of malignant intracranial tumour. Um, we see a lot of them nowadays. Well, we always have, but we see even more of them nowadays. Predominantly because the generic treatment for cancers is improving. So people are living longer who have been cured. They're five years post maybe. And unfortunately then I, I have seen a number of people who then 10 or 20 years later have a metastasis that has gone to the brain and they presented with a seizure. Why it's suddenly come up now 10 or 20 years later, I don't know, but we're seeing more of these sort of patients. Often, but not always, these patients have got poor prognosis due to the actual disease in itself. If you've got a secondary in the brain, then obviously you've got a disseminated disease, um, which you might just have one in the brain, you might have more METs elsewhere. Certain types of Genetic changes within these tumours can be targeted with better uh, chemotherapies and immunotherapies nowadays, such as some um, uh, EGFR mutations and some melanomas, and patients can have much better outcomes from that. And in fact, nowadays we are finding that there are certain patients who might originally have had their, tumor, their systemic tumour treated, have had SRS for a couple of METs, carry on for six months, a year, and then they come back, the rest of their disease is controlled, but they've got a couple more METs and they have SRS again. And they're having these multiple episodes of SRS, but not necessarily because the disease is absolutely terrible and it's coming quickly, but because they're surviving long enough that SRS is still useful to them and will still keep them going. So that's really good. It does mean there's a lot more work for the SRS guys. Um, Whenever somebody has a metastasis, you need to get the information from the primary disease oncologist to decide what you're gonna help decide what you're gonna do. Um, and if there's one thing you guys take away from this is when you're junior doctors, when you're working as a GP in ED, in MAU, if you have a patient who you think has come with brain metastases and you, and you either know what the primary is or you have a strong suspicion what the primary is from doing a CT tap and find lung mass, Go to the primary oncologist first, as long as obviously the brain is safe. Go to the primary oncologist first, because we will want to know lots of things like what's their prognosis, because obviously if they are unfortunately overrun with disease elsewhere, treating their brain mats is not gonna really help them. Um, we want to know what their functioning's like. We want to know if the primary disease specialists have got treatment for everything else as well. Just all those things are really important for us to know before we go making a decision to do what could be a really big operation. Uh, just a, a quick look at, so this is an MRI scan with a T1 with contrast and you can see this well circumscribed nice little metastasis, which looks prime for just giving a bit of stereotactic radio surgery to. So that's when you give high dose radiation, which is very focally targeted and that can halt or even make them recede. And this unfortunately is a patient who has a number of metastases. You can see they've probably got a bit of hydrocephalus coming on here because that's in their cerebellum. So that's probably causing them some hydrocephalus by blocking their fourth ventricle. And um, 
you know, some, some patients who have disease like this, there's nothing that neurosurgery you can do because you can't go operating on all these. It's far too much volume for stereotactic radio surgery because that you can give to a diameter of three centimeters or a volume of 20 cc. So that's too much. Uh, I'll also mention meningiomas because I have a huge amount of these that come across my, uh, my door. They are common. This is in the elderly, so you're more likely to get them as you get older. And autopsy studies have found that you, they are present to some degree in quite a significant amount of the population. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're in 6.2% of people who are 20 that increase with age. And their average age of presentation or, or being diagnosed is about 66 years old. Um, they are graded from one to three. And generally, the higher the grade is, the more likely they are to occur, the quicker they're likely to grow, and the more likely they are to invade brain, keep coming back if you operate on them, those sorts of things. Currently, the diagnosis is on history pathology but it's not really very accurate because otherwise if you were very accurate why would your grade ones be coming back and yet you'd have a grade three that may never come back so it's not really precise there's a few studies going on at the moment into looking at genetic changes because quite a few genetic changes have been found to be more predictive of if um, if they recur your options are if you get a patient with one of these, you can do surveillance, which is just doing multiple MRI scans at a year, every few years, that sort of thing. Or you can do nothing. So I get referred a huge amount of these patients who have CT scans for head injury, assessment for dementia, all sorts of headaches, all sorts of things. And they have a little tiny, if it's calcified, it's less likely to grow little tiny meningioma that, especially in people who are very elderly, are unlikely to grow within their natural lifespan. And then so the NICE guidelines say that if they are incidental, you should um, discuss with the patient about following up in one year with an MRI scan and then either discharge or do it five years later. If it's someone who's a bit younger, I probably would do so because they've got more lifespan in which for it to grow but it varies. If there is a meningioma that is in an awkward position, so really maybe around the skull base, uh, an elderly patient, so maybe the, the benefits of surgery are outweighed by the risks, or if the patient chooses and it's under three centimeters and you're a little bit worried that it's a bit big or it might be growing a little bit, you can do stereotactic radio surgery, but it's got to be relatively small. And if it's large, if it's causing symptoms, if it's increasing in size and they don't want this or it's not appropriate or it's really easy to get to surgically, you remove it. And this is, I mean, it's quite an old MRI scan, but this is an MRI scan for a person who has a very large meningioma. And actually, I, or we see in my department quite a number of these, I'd say we get one or two a month, have really large meningiomas. And you can tell that they just grow slowly, slowly, a millimetre a year, because if this came on over a couple of months, the brain would have definitely had problems and manifested symptoms in quite a rapid way. Whereas these patients tend to present with things like flat affect, not quite being right, memory going, frontal symptoms like that, possibly then their vision starts to go. And, uh, and then they get diagnosed with this. Now, clearly, you're not just going to sit and watch that unless the patient is significantly on, too unwell for an operation. And that's far too big for radio surgery. So you, that's, that's resection. These, again, I see quite a number of these. This is a lateral sphenoid meningioma. And the reason why I've brought this up is this is a, a flare. So that's a T2 where the CSF is suppressed. So it's not sort of bright and getting in your way when you're looking at it. You can see there's a nice boundary around it. You can see the blood vessels that are on the cortical surface with a CSF line around it. So again, it's starting to cause, well, it is causing compression. A little bit of edema there, that really needs to come out. 
this one here just looks a little bit more nasty. The edge isn't quite so nice and like flat as that one. It's more jagged. You see these blood vessels underneath that look like they're really going into it. That CSF line you can't really see here. So although you can't tell for sure off an MRI scan or off the imaging, I would say this is likely to be a higher grade, possibly a grade three. In terms of guidelines, that if you want to know where we get um, the vast majority of recommendations for the work that we do in oncology, these are the main ones. Uh, NICE guidelines came out in 2018. And then you've got, um, this is the classification that I showed you those two blue tables earlier. Um, and this is a European one from 2017. So uh, they're relatively up to date. Uh, for guidelines in neurosurgery. It's not often you get up-to-date guidelines because things move on so quick. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about gliomas. These I'm not going to go into detail for because they are quite distinct. There's a lot of different things with them and I don't frankly have time. And I'm sure that you will absolutely fall asleep even more if I started going on about those. What I'm going to talk about mainly are these astrocytic and oligodendroglial tumours. Um, because we see a lot of them. They are tumours of the brain, from the brain, from glial cells, and glial cells are basically what is in your brain that aren't neurons. Um, so astrocytes, the ones that are star-shaped and form a structural support. Uh, oligodendrocytes uh, are um, the equivalent of um, Schwann cells in, in nerves, and wrap around the um, nerves. And this just all looks very complicated. There's lots of different words here. There's lots of different terms because this is how things changed in 2016. So I'm gonna talk, tell you a little story about how I was taught to do things when, you know, back in 2010 when I started. So back in the day, the type of tumor was based upon histology and the imaging. So you'd have an MRI scan. This is one of those uh, flares, which is the T2, and this is a T1 with contrast. And you would see a tumor that is clearly in the brain. It looks like it's of the brain, so it looks like it's part of it. It doesn't have that nice um, border like you saw on the MET before. And on the T2, it would look like this. And on the T1, you see no contrast enhancement. Okay, you, you don't see any whiteness showing up. And then you compare that to this MRI, where this is a, a T2, you see a CSF of white here. You can see a lot of edema around it. You can see something here, and it's taking up contrast. It looks a little bit more invasive, a little bit more like it's just sort of spreading out. And so this contrast enhancement is where you start to say, ah, I think that this is a low-grade glioma. And I think this different patient has a high grade glioma because the uptake of contrast makes you think that they've got neovascularization, um, more breakdown of the blood brain barrier, that sort of thing. So you'd you know, take samples or whatsoever, and the histopathologist would look at it like this. So they would call a WHO grade two or a low grade glioma based on infiltration, there's more cells than they would expect, that sort of thing. If they started to see neovascularization, so new blood vessels that are abnormal forming, they would then call it a grade three or an anaplastic astrocytoma. When then you start to get uh, the tumor outgrowing its blood supply, you get death or, or hypoxia and necrosis in the middle of the tumor. And that's when it would be called a grade four because it means that it is growing quickly. Back in the day, we used to use the term glioblastoma multiforme. Nowadays, the word multiforme is not put on, but we still call them GBN. So, so it's the, the OMA is the N. And so that's how they used to be graded. And so you would get these grades. Now within these glioblastomas, you would get some which are secondary that started off maybe like this. And then with time, gently expanded and then had another genetic change and started going up from grade two, grade three, grade four. This then was another type of tumor, still a glioma, but called 
an oligodendroglioma coming from those oligodendrocytes. This is what you call a fried egg pattern. And you can see quite nicely, it looks like fried eggs. And then you get what was called chicken wire um, neovascularization, which I've got to be honest, I've never really looked at it and gone, oh yeah, chicken wire. But anyway. And then oligodendrogliomas were called low grade or high grade, basically based on things like how many mitoses were seen when you looked at it under a microscope and things like that. There were some that didn't quite have things that met this, might have looked a bit like this and people weren't really sure, the pathologists, and so they called them oligoastrocytomas. This diagnosis nowadays pretty much does not exist unless you have not been able to get a decent biopsy. So this is my 2010 textbook from when I started, so the good old Greenberg handbook, it has been updated since. And these are the basic median survival, so that's the 50% patient, how long they would survive. So for grade two, they would say seven to eight years, grade three, two to three, and grade four, under a year. And I'm going to show you a few graphs like this. So this is called Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And you will see a lot of these sorts of things in um, especially cancer or oncology, not just brain. And this shows the survival of patient of a cohort of patients, or if you're looking at sort of progression-free survival, things like that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about these graphs so that you understand what I'm talking about. So one means 100% of the patients are still alive, haven't progressed, whatever. And zero, of course, means that everybody has. So your median survival in this case is at 0.5 or 50%. Every time something happens, so say the patient dies in this case, because that's what our outcome is, you will see a drop in the patient cohort over time, all right? So on this, you will see that for grade twos, which are A, their median survival in this paper was about 50 months. For the grade threes, that's B, their median survival was 20. And for the grade fours, their median survival was about 15 months. That's more or less what we used to kind of tell people. And we used to say that in the young people, and that's, like, that's under 45, if they have a low grade astrocytoma, so not the oligodendrogliomas, the astrocytomas are the gliomas that are grade two, then after about four years ish, or just under four years, they would change to the higher grade. And at that point, their survival would go down to a year. If they were over the age of 45, it was likely that they were probably already just undiagnosed and had already gone along the path of it. So they only had about seven and a half months before they changed and then their survival went down to a year. So that's, that's really bad. And these are the people that then worry about living with a ticking time bomb in their head. For oligodendrogliomas, uh, this textbook said that if they were surgically treated, so removed as much as you could, their survival was uh, three years post-op on average. So still pretty bad for a low grade. And then the 2016 classification came along because we were noticing that there was a lot of heterogeneous uh, survival. I mean, I even now have somebody who definitely has a glioblastoma, a grade four, who has been operated on four times and has survived 10 years. And I do not know why he has survived, yet so many others have died um, after, you know, within months. And yet you get some grade twos that do die really quickly. So why, that, that never really made sense. And so nowadays they look at the molecular pathology and that is the thing that is primarily what the diagnosis is based upon. So we look at IDH1 and IDH2 mutations and a patient needs to have this to be diagnosed as somebody who has a diffuse astrocytoma or an oligodendroglioma. So one of those sort of lower grades that are either going up the grades or is still a low grade. If somebody has one of these, they then go on to test the 1P19Q. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And if they have this, it is a diagnosis, diagnosis of oligodendroglioma, irrelevant of what the cells look like nowadays. 
In glioblastoma, so those grade fours, they also look at MGMT promoter methylation. So this is a mutation that is actually, to some extent, good because team azolamide works a lot better, relatively a lot better for patients with this. Uh, these BRAF uh, changes might be, for these type of conditions, um, good targets for various uh, chemotherapies. So you know, there's some positive there for them. And then this histone mutation is diagnostic of some of these really aggressive gliomas and unfortunately it's a poor prognostic factor. So we don't have anything to treat that at the moment, but it's a potential for the future. And it means that you can get better um, information to people. So if you have a glioma, the way that we diagnose it nowadays is you need a biopsy. So whether you've taken out as much tumor as possible, you've just done a needle biopsy. The pathologists look at it down a microscope and say, mm, it looks like a glioma. And they might go, oh, I think it's oligodendroglioma, but nowadays they will never say. Next, they will do the immunohistochemistry. So this mutation in arginine is one of the, is the most frequently present if somebody has an IVH mutation. And immunohistochemistry is when you get an antibody that picks up this specific mutation and then shows up brown. So this patient has got an IVH one mutation. This patient does not. And when they don't, we call it wild type. So it's what you find in the community, like normal people. If this simple test hasn't picked up an IDH mutation, but you're still pretty suspicious, so say the patient's young or it looks a little bit like it on a um, scan, then you send it for the IDH2 genetic sequencing because they don't have immunohistochemistry for that, widely available. So once you've identified a patient with this, you go on to do fluorescence in situ hybridization for 1P19Q co-deletion. So quite handily, we've got our fried egg cells. So that gives us an idea that it might be an oligodendroglioma. And if you look at this here, so this is 1P and 1Q, so the chromosomes part, 1P and 1Q, and the 1Q is green. And you can see two copies of that in these cells, but you can only see one copy of the 1P. And of the 19P, you can see two copies. And of the 19Q, you can only see one. So there is a deletion here of one of the 1Ps and one of the 19Qs. So if they have that, then that is an oligodendroglioma, regardless of if it looks nice like this. The grading at the moment is still done on the pathology. And we're a little bit, we're not 100% satisfied with that now. There are some other genes, CDK, uh, N2A stroke B, which can mean that they act more like a higher grade or a grade four, but we haven't really got on top of the grading perfectly yet. Um, and then of course, if the IDH is wild type, then it's a glioblastoma. So what we used to call a primary glioblastoma is now called an IDH wild type, grade four tumor or glioma glioblastoma. And so these are all the different sorts of things that they can do and all the things that you can find. Note, oligoastrocytoma is very rarely used nowadays and only if you can't do these tests. So you don't have a sample that's big enough or the tests have not quite picked things up properly, that sort of thing. And so why does this matter? Because I don't have loads of new treatments that can react to these things. And I say, oh, you've got that. I can give you this great drug that works specifically for you yet. So that's something that might come in the future, but these things take a long time. A lot of our research is now unfortunately out of date or quite difficult to interpret because when it was done with the best of intentions and everybody looked down the slides and, and categorized these things, they didn't have these tests. And so they weren't quite categorized correctly. So if you are looking at um, any papers or things like that, and if you see that they've got a few oligoastrocytomas, that's often quite a good uh, measure 
of them doing it the old fashioned way and therefore that their data might be a little bit dirty. Not on purpose, it's just a bit old fashioned. Our prognostic data, so we can tell patients their prognosis a little bit better, but not perfectly. Um, and hopefully that will improve as well. And so just to demonstrate how this happens, um, this is a paper from 2016. So it's the year that that WHO classification came out. And obviously we, we had some idea of these things before, so they were already being tested um, throughout, but it just wasn't more of a sort of diktat that you had to do it. And so this was looking at temozolomide, which is a chemotherapy, against radiotherapy in people who had a low grade glioma. So it was, it was categorized as grade two, but there were some things about it that made you think that it might be a little bit more um, poor prognosis. So if they were a little bit older, the uh, MRI scans were looking worse, they had new symptoms, that sort of thing. So they recruited all their patients over five years. And again, just note how long it takes for these things to be done, because although they would have recruited for this in this time, the study would have been started, got ethical approval, gone through all sorts of things at least five years before this. So that's how long it takes, you know, maybe 16 years to get to the publication. Um, 240 radiotherapy versus 237 temozolomide. And when they then post hoc went back and looked at all the patients and went, oh, maybe we should check their genetics. 14% of them were IDH wild types, so with a primary glioblastoma. So we're definitely not in this group because they're the wrong grade. And also they're not even, they haven't come up from the low grades. And 25% of them were oligodendrogliomas. What's quite interesting is that when they looked at their agreement rates between their histopathologists, so in this paper, they got a histopathologist in the local hospital to say, this is the diagnosis. And then they sent the slides to a histopathologist in the big sort of central um, research hub. And they looked at the um, reliability between the two. So for a kappa for reliability, if you have perfect concordance, it's one. And if it's absolutely imperfect, it's zero. And generally we say that 0 0.7 is acceptable. And so it was 0 0.3 from the peripheral hospital to the central pathologist. And it was 0 0.4 between the two pathologists and the central hub. So you, even there, you can tell that the tumor types that were being diagnosed were just really educated guesses. And so then they looked at their progression-free survival. So this isn't overall survival, i.e. patients dying, this is until MRIs look like they're getting worse. And if you look at the 50%, so for the uh, co-deleted, so that's an oligodendroglioma, the survival rates are far more than those who have a diffuse astrocytoma. And of course, those are far more than those who have what we used to call a primary glioma or an IDH wild type. And again, you can see these 50% are somewhat what, like what we're starting to think nowadays. And then when they looked at the rates of um, survival for radiotherapy versus temozolomide, and of course these, these much smaller cohorts because they've split them into three, um, it's significant that radiotherapy was better for the diffuse astrocytomas, but not so much for the um, oligodendrogliomas. And again, not so much for the glioblastomas. So those treatments should be different. Jacola et al are a group in Norway that had a really good paper in 2012 where they looked at two separate hospitals that just happened to treat low-grade gliomas differently. In one hospital, if a low-grade glioma was diagnosed, they tended to remove as much as possible. And in the other hospital, they did biopsy. And in 2012, they published this which showed that in these low-grade gliomas, if you did a resection, the patient survived significantly longer than if you did a biopsy only. And that changed a lot of treatment. A lot of people never, didn't operate on these until they looked like they were progressing. And it started people operating a lot earlier, which is what we do now. It's called cytoreduction, removing the cells that might change. And so when, the new guidelines came out, they 
that went back and reassessed the genetics of all their tumors. And it came out with number one, completely different um, patterns, as you can see, and as we are starting to expect nowadays. Um, these are the astrocytomas. And again, there's a big difference here. There's slightly less of a difference seen for the oligodendrogliomas, um, but the numbers really aren't there to be really, really sure of that. Um, and these are people who've had glioblastoma, so they're a completely different subset. So we know that low-grade gliomas, you should really try and take out as much as, as possible, as early as possible. With GBMs, whether they are primary or secondary, we've moved up the ladder. Um, I always tell people that my aim is to remove as much as possible while preserving their quality of life, because there's no point taking out a huge amount and then um, causing devastation, so causing them a stroke and things like that. I still give people these approximate numbers that if you have a glioblastoma and nothing is done for it, then generally people's median overall survival is two to three months. It's really bad, unfortunately. If they have surgical resection on its own, again, the survival isn't really that much better. If you do resection and what's called the Stutt protocol, so this is the gold standard at the moment where you do a resection of as much as is safe, um, followed by chemotherapy and radiotherapy, chemotherapy being a temozolomide, which is a tablet, and their overall survival is 12 to 14 months. So it's still nowhere near what we would like. And studies have shown that the higher the extent of resection, the more that you take out, the better their overall survival. And again, you can see this on this Kaplan-Meier curve, that the more you take out, the longer patients tend to survive. The same on this one here. So how do we do that? And this is where the subspecialization of neuro-oncology is really coming on. It's a change in mindset to take surgery, I don't say more seriously, but to really, really strive to get as much as possible. We use intraoperative neuronavigation a lot more, so things like brain lab and stealth, where you can match the patient up to the scans they've had preoperatively, so you can really tell where the edges of the tumor should be. Something you have to be careful of is brain shift because the moment you take the skull off, the brain can either dip down because you can't or it can swell up a little bit if it's a big tumor. And the MRI, of course, doesn't know that you've done that and so can't compensate for that. So you've got to be careful that you don't um, get misled at that point. We're using 5ALA, also called Glylan, which is a drink that, um, you give it to the patient a few hours before surgery, it goes around their system, goes to the blood brain barrier, and it shows the tumor boundaries up under blue light. Because the problem with glioblastomas is, and low grade gliomas to some extent, because they are diffuse, um, they don't often really show up their boundaries really well, so it's difficult to know where the edge is. But if you have given them this in, in high grade gliomas, it shows up really nicely and you can try to take as much as is possible, of course, if you're not going into eloquent tissue and causing any strokes and things like that. So that's really good. And it's shown that uh, the complete resection rates are better with that. Um, and here's one that I did about a month ago, I think it was. And you can see it just show up really nicely. Let me just take that out. Other things that we can do, so you can use intraoperative ultrasound. So you put your ultrasound on and you can see the edge of your tumor nicely. You can also see your sulci, your ventricles, which can uh, make life easier. And you can also match this ultrasound to preoperative MRIs so that you can accommodate a little bit more for that brain shift. It takes a bit of training to do that. Um, there's also intraoperative MRI, where you do your operation, take out as much as you think is safe or needed, or you've got all your tumor, and then you cover up the patient. Of course, they're nice and sterile, pop them through the MRI scanner. And if you see a little bit extra left, then you can just take that and scan them again if you want. Um, this is really expensive to put in. Um, it's good especially for children, because a lot of children will need to have a post-op MRI anyway, so you can do it all under one general anesthetic if they need a GA for that. 
Um, we don't have one of these in Cardiff. I'm not sure it's entirely necessary in an adult practice, because if you are trying to do, to take as much as is safe, i.e. take as much as possible without causing a deficit and just do it awake and then take it until the patient gets deficits and then you stop. So, yeah. Um, other improvements that are going on is um, a better understanding of the anatomy and therefore trying to avoid causing deficits. So we all know Broadman's areas and the cortical representation, but we found well, the anatomists and, and the um, MRI tractography has found the uh, streams and white fiber tracks that you can avoid. So you can, if you're going through brain, you can target where you're going through a lot better for individual patients as well. And of course, there's lots and lots of research going on. And so something that is trying, that Nansik did uh, earlier, last year? Yes, last year. Sorry, it was COVID, I've forgotten what year we're in. And the ELISA GB was trying to look at what everybody was using in theatre and what sort of adjuncts were being used and how good the resections were. I'm sure that's going to be published in the relatively near future. There's a trial going on called Future GP, uh, GB, which is looking at using ultrasound and matching that up to preoperative MRIs within theatre to see if you're able to get better resection margins. And then it just, there's, there's various other studies that are going on looking at chemotherapies and radiotherapy. I mean, this is the most contrived uh, abbreviation I think I've ever seen, but lots of things like that are going on. Uh, and so just to, to turn more to what's going on in the future, um, you might have seen this lady. I don't know if anybody recognizes that. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna ask you all to shout out if you know. Uh, this is Tessa Jowell. She was an MP um, who had a glioblastoma and may, you may have seen her in the Houses of Parliament looking like this. And this is uh, tumor treating fields. So if you've got a glioblastoma and you've had the gold standard treatment that we have at the moment, um, there's a field generator on the patient's head which um, causes uh, alternating electric fields. And because of that disruption, the mitotic spindles can't um, align properly. So you can't get as good mitosis. And then it has been shown in a trial that it does improve the median survival. And so the question is then, well, why aren't we using this on all our patients? Number one, there are quite a few reactions to it. Number two, yes, it's significant. It's only three months. And this is what you have to go through to get it. So you have to have a shaved head so that you can get the electrodes on. You have to wear it at least 18 hours a day. So you take around this little funky backpack that they very generously provide for you. The electrodes have to be changed a couple of times a week and it costs a lot of money. So NICE couldn't um, agree to this based on the amount of benefit that it gives patients. And a lot of the problems that research has with trying to find um, revolutions or trying to improve the outcome of these patients is the blood brain barrier, which is really good, although it does let some nets through, which is annoying but it's really good at isolating the brain from the rest of the body. There's a huge amount, or there's a huge um, surface area for these capillaries. And you would think, oh, well, actually, GBMs, they have neovascularization. These blood vessels that come up aren't right. They're, they're sort of manky blood vessels. So isn't the, don't they have a more permeable vasculature and therefore if you do give something it would preferentially give to the GBM. Uh, by the way this stands for blood brain tumor barrier but unfortunately it does still work quite well in the vast majority of the, the glioblastoma so doing things for that won't be the best. So there are lots of trials going on looking at small molecule drug candidates so for example temozolomide which is what we use gets through because it is a small molecule 
but even then it only has about 20% of its overall bioavailability, only 20% of it manages to get in the brain uh, within the tumours, it's very poor. Can you co-administer uh, a chemotherapy with a vasoactive compound or mannitol, something that dilates out the blood vessels and therefore means that they might open up a bit more? But then again, if you do that, how do you just get it to the GBM and not the rest of the brain or the rest of the body and therefore cause problems with the rest of the brain when it gets chemotherapy administered to it? There's a lot of work with trying to spark an immune response to the tumour itself. So uh, by doing, putting viruses into people so that um, they bring in DNA that sparks off all these um, uh, interleukins and tumor necrosis factor, all those sorts of things that causes the uh, patient's own immune system to fight against it. DC Vax L is a vaccination where they take the patient's own tumor, spin it down, inject it into the patient themselves so that you get an immune system reaction against that vaccine and then hopefully against the tumor itself. Um, that has gone through a phase three study. Uh, the early results were published in 2018 and were quite beneficial, I think they'd reach, reached a median of 23 months, which is good for a GBM. Um, but we're still waiting for the final results on that. Nice are waiting for the final results and a little bit more information on it as well. So it's too early to say. And just to tell you how long these things take to come to fruition. So that the early results were published in 2018. We don't have the final results. And I looked this up earlier, the earliest sort of application they had for this was 2002. So that's taken 18 years to get the clinical trial through, never mind the early stuff. Um, you can give local targeted therapies to try and disrupt the tight junctions uh, in the endothelium. So you can use ultrasound with micro bubbles that are injected to try and rip, the, get those micro bubbles to agitate and sort of rip through those tight junctions. But again, how do you target that for the tumor specifically? Laser interstitial thermotherapy is when you under MRI guidance, put a laser down and then heat the tip to try and disrupt uh, the vessels. And then there's lots of things that they might try and put into tumors. So gliadin is something that's already established, it's already nice uh, proved. It's fallen out of fashion a little bit. And that's when you put carmistine wafers, so like chemotherapy within the tumor cavity after you've removed as much as is possible. And get some wound breakdown and infection problems with it. So I think that's predominantly why people don't use it very much nowadays. Um, some of the groups in Europe are trying an excising tumour and then putting iron oxide nanoparticles in and then heating them up to try and sort of cause an immune reaction around the edge. But this quite nicely shows the problem that a lot of these therapies, experimental therapies get, which is just a lot of swelling and a lot of reaction around the tumour itself. So the target is the problem. And then another type is confection enhanced delivery. So this is done more by Prof Gill in children with um, brainstem gliomas, where you put a little port in here, it connects to some tubes that go to the skull and then go into the tumor itself. And you put chemotherapy into the port. So you can deliver it directly into the tumor. And those are all sorts of things that are ongoing Take a long time, unfortunately, to come to me, the clinician who's just trying to sort out the patient. But there's huge amounts of research, absolutely huge. Um, even looking, cranky, sorry. Uh, I had a quick look on the Brains Trust, which has a, a little list of trials that are going on and the sorts of things I've looked at chemotherapeutics, quality of life, looking at tissues. A lot of MRI studies are going on to try and see if they can diagnose patients without having to go into the brain and take biopsies, um, which could possibly put me under the job. <laughs> um, and then looking into why some patients have seizures, why do some have reactions to drugs and others don't. And then looking at really, really fundamental making of cell lines and things like that. So for those of you who are interested, um, I had a quick look through my Twitter to see the people that you might be interested in following. This is not exhaustive, but some of the people that I tend to follow, I mean, that's me. These are some of um, the sort of 
younger neuro-oncology surgeons that are my mates, I suppose, uh, but they put things up uh, with relative frequency to do with the topic. Um, here are some of the consultants, some of which are quite um, researchy, and here are some more of the research, predominantly more research-based people, Prof Jenkins, Hutchinson, and Prof Watts. Um, Prof Hutchinson's in Cambridge, and he uh, isn't an oncology surgeon, but he's a neurosurgeon who does a lot of work with uh, the MRC and a lot of the research applications and things like that. This is the future GB uh, trial um, Twitter account. And then there's just some generic ones if you want some education stuff from over the pond in America. Um, and then just to finish off, here are some societies. Obviously you guys know the SBNS. I don't need to tell you about NANSIG. I don't need to tell you about the BNTA. Um, in Britain, we've got the New Oncology Society. In Europe, there's the EANO. In America, I think it's just America, the SNO. And then just for a little bit more education, if you want to look into more things, here are some good sites for looking up operations, neuroanatomy, all those sorts of things. Those references. <laughs>